But how many believe indeed your Bible is true? How many believe we're in very serious times? How many believe it's time for the church to wake up? We're going to be preaching very serious to you. We're always serious uh, about what we do. But I have a very serious subject matter this morning, and I pray that everything that's on your mind that you'll block out and give me just a, a, a little bit of your time this morning where you allow God to speak to your heart. And then I ask you, if God speaks to your heart, that you respond to it, okay? How many believe that's what He wants us to do? How many wants the blessings of God, not only in your personal life, but in your church? And, and how many want the blessing of God on your country again? And it doesn't take much look around to know that something's gone wrong, hasn't it? Acts chapter 15, on this Memorial Day weekend, I want you to look at verse number 19. The Bible says, Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. But that we write unto them that, ye, that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and, and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner, the apostles and elders and brethren send greetings unto the brethren, which are the Gentiles in Antioch in Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, Ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. And so there is a lot, stop right there, there is a lot that goes on in the name of religion that is not so. Say amen. And Paul is correcting that. They're going to be sending a delegation to address this and to shore up those believers. He said it seemed good to us being assembled with one accord. To send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Verse 26. Notice this. Underscored in your heart. Underscored in your mind. And certainly underscored in your Bible. Men that have. What's the next word church? Hazarded their. What's the next word? Well that's powerful isn't it? Men who have hazarded their lives. Meaning it was not an accident. They did not stumble on potential danger. They ran to it for the cause of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says men that have hazarded their lives for the name of who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. How many would agree with this preacher this morning and agree with God's Word that the Lord is worth us laying it all on the line for? He laid it all on the line for us, didn't He? And more. Notice that word hazarded. I was looking up the definition of that word. It simply means, now let it sink in, it means to deliver up one to custody. It means to be judged. It means to be condemned. It means to be punished. It means to be scourged, tormented, and often put to death. That's powerful, isn't it? And so when the Bible said there was men who hazarded their lives, they were not suicidal, they were not looking to die, but they loved their Lord so much. And they loved the souls in whom Jesus died for so much. That they were willing to lay it all on the line for His namesake. On this Memorial Day weekend, we are grateful for those who paid the ultimate sacrifice for our country's freedom and representation. And not just for our freedom, just representing our country. My mind goes back and I see the images of Arlington National Cemetery. If you've never been there, you need to go sometime. Very sobering. 
Cross after cross after cross after cross after cross markers of people that laid down their life for the cause of freedom. Not just for the cause of freedom, but they laid down their life for our country. I'm grateful for those that did that for our physical country, but I'm very grateful for those that have done it for our spiritual country. How many of you are saved and know it? Just say amen. You know it. How many would agree that this world is just our temporary dwelling place? It's not our home. And so what is our home? Our home is in heaven. Thank God for those dear saints of God, both men and women, who laid it all on the line and some even faced death because they loved Jesus. Because they loved people. And because they hated the devil. I want to ask the question on this Sunday morning. Are we all in? Are we one that can fit that category? Said there's those that have hazarded their lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that we, we want to desire to get ourselves in, in, in harm's way, but I'm asking you, is the Lord so important and so precious to you? Are lost and dying people going to hell, are they that important to you that you're willing if need be, that you're willing to put yourself out, that you're willing to stick your neck out a little bit for the cause of Christ. My thought for the morning is, where are the heroes? Where are the heroes? Thank God for the heroes that I've read about for our country and some of the fighting that they did. But Thought to the bitter end for the cause of this country. The courage that they had. And their testimony lives on. Heroes. What about the heroes of today spiritually? I'm glad for the heroes we have physically today. And not all, not all of them have died. The fact that they're willing to die. And have stuck their neck out. They're a hero. Let me ask you something. Where are all the heroes today? I'm talking about spiritually. Where's the heroes? We all say that I hope all of you are saved. Somebody here may not be. And if not, you need to be saved today. But where's the heroes? Where are the people that's willing to lay everything on the line? Where are all the people that's willing to stick their neck out? If it meant a little ridicule, if it meant a little abuse, if it meant a little bit of alienation, where are the men and the women today? How many agree we need heroes in every generation? Don't you think that those younger people look for heroes? Look what they're finding in heroes. They're finding Hollywood as their heroes. We need people in the local church. And if it hits you, I pray that the Holy Ghost will send a missile your way today. I pray that He'll lodge right in the innermost part of your heart. That He'll convict you. And that you'll bring it before God and say things aren't right. They need to be right. They must be right for Christ's sake. We need heroes. May I say, first of all, in order to be a hero, there must first be allegiance. When I talk about allegiance, we're talking about patriotism. Did you know we kind of got an odd idea, a skewed idea of what a patriot is? We, how many have heard the term patriot and patriotism? We think because we raise a flag, and we should, and we ought to be proud of that flag, that that makes us a patriot. Not necessarily so. Do you know what the absolute definition of a patriot is? It is a person who vigorously supports their country and is prepared to defend it against enemies and detractors. In other words, a true patriot is one who is willing, if necessary, at any cost to defend its country not only from attack but from detraction. 
How many believe we need that spiritually? We need some spiritual patriots that love their country, love their God, loves his mission so much, and knows the enemy is out there so much that they're willing to do everything in their power under God to defend it. Now we know the Lord, he's on the winning side and everything for the child of God. We are the victors, right? But there is a war going on. And it is the war for men's souls. And just because you're saved by the grace of God, the devil can't get your soul. But he sure is bargaining to try to get your mind. And to get your affection. It's a warfare. Are you a patriot? Are you a soldier? Will you be a hero? Everyone, listen, every single being here today can be a spiritual hero. If you will. Every, you, you're talking about me, I'm talking about you. You see, think about this, guys. We know the Lord gets all the glory and the Lord does the work, but He does it through people. Am I right? Let me ask you something. If one person had an influence on another for the cause of Christ and that person gets saved in the mind of God, that person gets saved, are they grateful to God? Do they give Him the glory? Yes. But aren't they thankful for you too? In a real sense of the world, you're a hero to them because you cared enough to pull them out of the fire. Are you with me so far? Where are the heroes? There must be allegiance. Are we a true patriot of heaven? Notice what the Bible says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 1 and 2. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. How many believe that's true? Say amen. Then the Bible says, set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. Let me ask you, where today, right now, at this very moment, where's your heart? Who's got your heart right now? Maybe it's that toy that you bought that's got your heart. Maybe it's that job that you have that's got your heart. Maybe those fun and games and ball and, and, and hunting and all that, maybe that's got your heart. We can't be true patriots unless God gets it. Amen? Now watch this. If God gets our heart, then everything else falls in place, don't it? If God gets your heart, everything else, God will help you with. You'll love your family the way you ought to. You'll try to do things that you ought to. You'll work the job that you ought to. But God has to get our heart. We've got the buggy before the horse. We send out people. And I spent time in the Marine Corps. There were some guys, listen, there were some that were there. And there were some that even went overseas. And they wore the uniform. They were enlisted, but their heart wasn't in the right place. They were over there, but they weren't a patriot. But there were some that loved their country. I think about reading some of those docu documentaries and watching some of those documentaries of these men and women that loved their country. They believed in the cause. And they, many of them, listen, many of them were wounded and went and got some healing and wanted to go right back and fight again. Because they believed in it. And we believe in everything else. We got everything else that we get excited about. I guarantee on this Sunday morning that if I had tickets to, for you guys to a major sporting event, there would be people hooping and hollering and excited about it. You talk to people about a revival meeting. You talk to them about a special service where God is wanting to meet with us and God is wanting to do something and it doesn't affect them at all. Listen to your preacher. He's trying to tell you something this morning. There must be allegiance. Where's your affection? We have to function here. But where's your heart right now? Secondly, there not only must be allegiance, there must be alarm. How many remember 
How many remember where you were when you got the news? I'll never forget in our former home, in our basement. I had the news on. I believe it was the Today Show at the time. And right as Connie was walking down the steps with one of our children, the news broke and the images right there in live time. We saw those planes hit. How many remember it? In live time, right before our very eyes, we saw souls perishing. I can't get the images out of my mind of seeing those images of people coming out of those windows. And that, oh, what, without, it broke my heart. And all of a sudden, America got unglued. America got fed up, Brother John. And it was something that woke up our country for a short time. But it, for a short time, it woke us up and realized there's people out to get us. There's a real enemy. This thing ain't fun and games. There's people wanting to kill us. There's people not wanting our welfare. This is what we've been warned about. It's real. And moms lost their sons. Wives lost their husbands. Vice versa. And America got tough. And America began to say, We're going, we'll support whatever is necessary. To rid ourselves of this harm. What am I saying? I'm saying America was in a state of alarm. And America was in a state of shock. Can I hear an amen? Because I was. Never would I have thought right there in the middle of the city. That it could have happened in such a way as it did. But right before our eyes it happened. And we were shook up. And we were alarmed. We were disturbed. And America for a short time became united in determination and action. I remember when the President of our United States spoke up and he had the megaphone and he was speaking up and, and the applause and people were united and people for a while were truly patriotic. Their country mattered to them. But things kind of have faded to a degree. America had a truly defined enemy. Am I right? They went after them. Spiritually, ladies and gentlemen, how many agree that the attacks are rampant? The alarm has been sounding. Listen to this preacher very closely. When I was overseas, thank God we never actually had the attack, but we had several what was referred to as scud alerts. It was an eerie sound of hearing that siren sounding off. And immediately we had to don our gas mask and our gas suits when that thing went. It was a, it was a spooky feeling. Shook up. But the alarm sounded to get our attention. Listen to this preacher closely. God has been sounding the alarm for our country. And we are so, we are so caught up in our stuff that we don't even hear it. God has been shouting from the housetops, speaking to our hearts. And warning his children to rise up and say, by God's grace, we're going to be heroes. We're going to do what's right. We're going to pay the price. We're going to stand up against the enemy. He is, if you don't know we have an enemy, you, something's wrong. 
And guess what? He don't just have your mama, your daddy, and your children in his cross. He's got you right in his crosshairs. Every single one that's in this building, the devil has you right in his sights. He don't like you. He's not your friend. He wants to destroy you. And God is shouting from the housetops, warning us, warning us, warning God's children. And we're so busy with our stuff that means more to us than God, we don't hear the warning. Where are the heroes? There must be allegiance. There must be alarm. The Bible says be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion. You get that? He is going about seeking whom he may, help me finish that, devour. Do you understand what that means? It means to tear to shreds, to rip you apart, to destroy your being. And that's exactly what the devil wants for every one of us. And if you're lost, the devil not only wants to destroy your life, he wants to damn your soul. Where are the heroes? There must be allegiance. There must be alarm. Let me give you this hurriedly. There must be access to resources. I don't like the language in some of the war movies. But I do like watching them, not for my entertainment. It's sobering, guys. We're sitting, you're sitting, I'm standing in a beautiful building. God blessed us with it. But there's a lot of people that pay the ultimate sacrifice so we can even pull up in this parking lot today. That's fact. Some of you, I don't know the extent some of you may have seen some of that take place. I've sat down with people who's lost their buddies. My uncle didn't die. But my uncle was shot up in war. I was given a New Testament. And Brother John, that little New Testament, that Gideon little New Testament, has a bullet hole in it. He talked about the lives that were lost. And I remember in his latter days when his mind was leaving him. How it have flashbacks. Of being on that battlefield. And fighting. Fighting the good fight. Because he believed it was just. And there's been people that have done that spiritually. Fought the good fight. They've suffered wounds. But they believed the cause was just. They believed their leader was superior and marvelous. And they couldn't quit. We need access to resources. Leadership. I'm not talking about the local church right now. I'm talking about the captain of our salvation. Is he worth it? Every single one of you, ask yourself, is he is he worth it? Is he worth it? I think, I think back in the book of Joshua, we won't take time to turn there. I believe they've been going through it in Sunday school. The children of Israel have been given the land of Canaan. They just have to possess it. They have to go after it. And they're getting ready to cross the Jordan. They're approaching that time. And there's Jericho on the other side of the river. The place of conquest. And they're making preparations. And Joshua sees a man before him. And that man has a sword drawn in his hand. And he comes up to him, Brother Doug, and he says, Are you for us? Are you against us? In other words, friend or foe? And he answered this. He said, nay, I am the captain of the Lord's host. In other words, he said, I'm not just here to help you. I'm certainly not here against you. I'm here to take over this thing. Follow me. Follow me. Ladies and gentlemen, this battle's real. Our little children, the devil wants our kids. The devil wants you. The devil wants you out of church. The devil wants you not serving him. 
and he's going to fire bullets. And you say, preacher, I can't. I can't serve. I can't keep serving him. Hey, you have a God before us. His name is Jesus. He's King of kings and he's Lord of lords. He's the Lord of all. He is all powerful. He's omnipotent. He always has been, always will be. And he is forever God. And he can do everything but fail. He said, I'm taking over. Just follow me. If you'll follow me, we'll conquer. We need some people that understand that there are resources available. We have leadership, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have arms and armor. The Bible says to take on the whole armor of God. It's available to us. That's the defensive weapons. But then there's the offensive weapon. Praise God, we have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. How many have a Bible right now? Hey, watch this. That Bible ain't going to do you no good just waving it at the devil. He wants it. The Lord wants it in your heart. And when you put it in your heart and you follow it, you have a sword. And that sword is sharp on both edges. And praise God, that sword will get the job done. But it ain't going to scare the devil one bit just waving at him. It's not going to scare him one bit just you having it in your home. But it terrifies him when you open it up and you start to dig. And you begin to hide it in your heart. And you begin to live it out. That is the weapon of our warfare. It works. Watch this. Good housekeeping ain't going to do it. Your soap operas ain't going to do it. The National Enquirer sure ain't going to do it. Field and stream ain't going to do it. Harlequin romances ain't going to do it. That sort of spirit will. I tell you what, we're trying to fight spiritual battles with water pistols, and it ain't going to work. He ain't one bit. He ain't one bit afraid of our talk. He ain't one bit afraid of our little things, our little programs, and all. He's afraid though when a child of God and a people of God get in that Word of God, and that Word of God gets in them. He's terrified of that. There must be leadership. We have resources. Not only do we have resources, we need nourishment. Praise God, we have that. The Lord will give us what we need when we need it. He has all that we need, not only for our protection, but for our thriving and our welfare and our strength in this book. We have a place of healing. That's needed on battlefields. Amen. We're talking about those medics that had the the the. the, infirmary. They had the field hospitals. A place where those that were wounded could come and be tended to by people that cared about them. Ladies and gentlemen, there are soldiers that have been on the battlefield and they've been wounded but instead of people coming and picking them up and healing them and tending to them and taking care of them they've had to go it alone and die on the battlefield alone. May God help us. May God help this church. May God help this preacher to want to be a place where people can get healing when they are wounded. There's resources. I think about those soldiers. Boy, it's tough. I'm sure they didn't like bullets flying their way. And sometimes they were scared. But perfect love casteth out fear. They loved their country. Therefore, they knew they must, they must fight. Do you love your country? Do you really love your spiritual country? Are you really a citizen of it? You must fight. You must fight the good fight of faith. There must be access to resources. And let me give you this. There must be, hear me out, there must be aggression. I'm not talking about being mean-spirited. I'm not talking about any of that. But I want you to listen to me. You go out on a physical battlefield. and You ask, you interview some of those men that were in the heat of battle for their country. They could not pacify the enemy. I'm afraid in our churches... We've tried to pacify the enemy and try to get him to leave us alone. 
And so what we do is we begin to pattern the things that he likes. The things that's already in the world, that's the way we begin to pattern how we conduct and how we live our lives and what we believe as a church. Thinking we can pacify him that everything's going to be all right. But I want you to understand something. No matter what you try to do, he's still your enemy. Now, whether he tries to pop you in between the eyes or stab you in the back, he's still wanting to destroy you. And listen. If I got someone I know is wanting to hurt me, I know it. And I see them in sight. I'm not going to say, hey, guy, let's have a cup of coffee. No, if I know he's there to harm me, and he's there to harm that family, business is going to pick up real soon. You know what I mean? I'm not going to be there to try to appease him. I'm going to be doing my best to protect and to conquer. Amen? All right, listen. Do we believe the devil's real? All right, let me ask you this. How? How can we fight him sitting in our homes? How can we fight him doing things that have no eternal significance whatsoever? How can we fight him? How can we fight him sitting on a church pew? Now, you ought to be on a church pew. How can you fight him like that? No, you fight him when there's some people who rise up and say, but God's grace, we love our Lord this much. We love souls this much. We love our church this much. We love our county this much. We love our homeland this much that we're going to take up arms. They've been there all along. Hey, guys, listen. Listen closely. There's some people that the arms there, they ain't even figured out how to load it yet. Why don't you take some time and pick up that sword of the Spirit, that spiritual armor, and say, by God's grace, I'm going to be a soldier. And I'm not going to be in the retreat. Listen closely. I want you to think. Paint a picture real quick. We're going to close in just a minute. I told you the times that I was in a foxhole. Fortunately, everything turned out all right. I'm grateful. It could for me have been so much worse. The Lord protected me. There's a whole bunch of dead. Can you imagine digging those foxholes? For those of you that have been in the military. And you have somebody in that foxhole with you. That person, when the battle's not raging, they talk the big fight. How many of you ever heard somebody that, man, they can talk up a storm. But they can talk like they're the king of the universe. And they take on anybody. Just bring him. I've heard, bring the devil my way. It's funny. They say that until he comes. And here's time for the battle. They done been mouthing of all the things that they could do and what kind of great soldier and how much they love their country and they just love this and they love that. And boy, they're grateful for this. And then the bullets fly. And you look to see if they're behind you or beside you. And they're gone. Doesn't take much for us to talk a good talk. We ought to talk but God really wants us to walk. God really wants us to act and be aggressive. Again, we ought to be the kindest people in the world. I'm not talking about towards people. I'm talking towards the enemy. It's a war. And we've been spending too, many time, too much time in his playground playing by his rules and playing his games, even in the church house. And the Lord said, if you just listen to me. Pick up your, do you love me? Well, Lord, I sure do. Do you really love me? Well, yeah, Lord. Why are you sitting here? Service time comes. Do you really love me? Well, Lord, I'm a patriot. I love my country. Why are you there? Opportunities to serve him. And we look around and say, somebody ought to be doing, somebody ought to be firing against the enemy. That somebody's you. And somebody's me. Amen. Once you think about this and we close. 
I watched the movie again, didn't approve of the language, and, uh, and so had to, but a movie called Saving Private Ryan. You can only watch it because, of, and, and again, I know some of it was a dramatization, but it was based on, on truth. How many have heard and you've studied about the storming of the beach there in Normandy? I've seen documentaries of it. They're on these watercrafts that my understanding had, I, I don't think had never really been used before. This was a whole new thing. And these young men, they knew what was going to happen when they hit the shore. Can you imagine, guys, that before they even hit it, they were so nauseated from the seasickness that they, anything they had in their stomach was gone. They were sick as dogs. As soon as they came in sight, those howitzers begin to blast and mowing them down like someone mows their grass. And I see those images of those men and they're doing everything they can to get out. But as they're getting out, they're pressing on. The job was to take that beach. There's obstacles everywhere. Wire everywhere. Bullets flying. But they kept step by step by step. Kept moving forward towards that wall. Take that wall. Many of them lost their lives. And they were heroes in the high sense. And they would not quit. They would not coward. They would not go a wall. They took it seriously. And guess what? They took that beach. I remember watching those military commanders. And they have family just like everybody else. And they're doing everything they can to not only instruct but to encourage those men as bullets are flying. Keep on, keep on, keep on. There's the objective. Keep on, keep on. Follow me. And they stood there battered, beaten, bloodied. And many of their fellow soldiers didn't make that heal but they got to share in a victory I want to ask you on this Sunday morning Memorial Day weekend some of us don't even have our weapons out of the gun case we haven't even checked it out of the armory yet when we're supposed to be fighting the good fight of faith where are Every head bowed, every eye closed. Would you stand to your feet?